Hey everyone, I'm here in beautiful, sunny Napa Valley, California, right in the heart of California's greatest wine region. California's North Coast AVA includes the iconic Napa Valley AVA, as well as Anderson Valley, Sonoma Coast, and Sonoma Valley, just to name a few. With a wide variety of landscapes from rolling mountains to deep valleys and influences from the Pacific Ocean, there's no wonder why the North Coast is home to some of the world's finest wines. Whether it's Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, grown from some of the cooler sites, or a classic full-bodied Cabernet Sauvignon. California's North Coast is sure to spark an interest in everyone. Let's take a look. North from San Francisco, California's North Coast AVA stretches 100 miles along the Pacific coastline and 50 miles inland, with Mendocino County to the west and close to the ocean encompassing the well-known Anderson Valley. Lake County sits just to the east, further inland. And to the south, Sonoma County, which has 18 of its own AVAs, including the Russian River Valley and Sonoma Valley. Last but certainly not least is Napa County. East of Sonoma and north of the San Pablo Bay, Napa lies between the Mayacamas Mountains to the west and the Vaca Mountains to the east. Napa has a total of 16 AVAs, including the famous Oakville and Rutherford AVAs, home to the beloved Cabernet Sauvignon. Wine history in California can be traced back to the late 1600s when Spanish missionaries planted vines along the coast. The wines made were either sweet and fortified or used for religious ceremonies. Over the years, plantings increased and by 1890, overplanting led to a decrease in grape and wine prices. Of course, between 1920 and 1933, Prohibition halted nearly all wine sales and production. The decades following Prohibition revitalized the California wine scene and wine quality increased. Then, in 1976, a famous French versus California blind wine tasting took place in Paris where two California wines were among the top picks. This iconic event became known as the Judgment of Paris and put California on the world wine map. Hey, I've got Kendall and Morgan with me from Ghost Block Estate Wine Portfolio. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Can you tell me a little bit about what we have behind us, uh, some of the vines and vineyards we've got here? Of course, so uh, we're at the Palissa Vineyard, um, named after our great-great-grandparents, their last names. And so we've got kind of a mixture of 60 acres of Cabernet, Zinfandel, Cab Franc, Malbec, Petit Verdot, and Monte Pulciano. 
Our great-great-grandfather, Giuseppe Palissa, um, started farming in Calistoga. 1903 was his first harvest. So actually, this harvest is our 120th anniversary. Oh, no so uh, we're very excited. I'm here in the Atlas Peak AVA within Napa Valley to take a deeper look at how the climate, landscape, and soils play an influential role into making these prestigious wines. Hey, I'm here in San Francisco, and as you can see, that's the Golden Gate Bridge right behind us. There's a crazy cool breeze coming in off the coast. That hits San Francisco Bay and San Pablo Bay and spread straight up into Napa and Sonoma, really cooling off those vines. Let's go take a closer look at that. California's North Coast ABA has a wide range of climates and influences, but much of the North Coast can be described as having a warm Mediterranean climate with a dry growing season. The Pacific Ocean plays a huge factor as it draws in cold waters and provides a cooling influence for vineyards near the coast and the bay. Fog can often form in the afternoons, cooling the vines and reducing sun exposure. California also has several mountain ranges that run the length of the state, protecting some vineyard sites from the ocean's cooling influences. Vines may be planted along the slopes at higher altitudes, meaning lower temperatures, but more sun exposure. This is excellent for ripening grapes and tannins. And vines that are planted on the valley floors are sure to receive warm temperatures with relief from fog and cool breezes. This is definitely probably one of the warmer vineyards. We have the Napa River along this tree line right okay. behind us. And most of our vineyards do follow the river. And so obviously, you know, can be great for water. Um, but we do have a really specific site, our vineyard called Blockhouse. Um, is our largest vineyard and it gets the San Pablo Bay breeze and that's really makes it ideal for growing 13 different varietals in that one vineyard sure. which is something that's very rare. Um, being on the valley floor people find you know it obviously to be warmer and the further north you go into Calistoga it gets even warmer and so Carneros being the coolest closest to the bay mm -hmm. and then Yachtville to Oakville which is where our vineyard holdings are. Yachtville can be a little bit cooler as it's a little bit more south. Um, and so just really kind of specific so, sites. So you pick certain varietals, you know, right. for the microclimate that we're in. So for instance, we'll have more sparkling varietals in Yontville versus here where we're going to have Bordeaux, Cab. Hey guys, I'm here with general manager Dave and Johannes, the winemaker of Shug Winery. Thanks for having me guys. Welcome to Shug. Thanks for visiting. Life changes just open the door. We're here at the uh, kind of the southern tip of Sonoma Valley in the Carneros District. Um, and known for cool climate wines such as Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Uh, we sit between, uh, right behind us is the, uh, the Sonoma Mountain. Right here is the Sonoma Valley. Just to the east of us is uh, the Mayacamas, which separates us uh, from Napa. What kind of influences, I know we've got a, a nice breeze coming up from the bay today. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the, the breezes and the influences that they make um, on the grapes. Sure. Actually, today we have the wind coming from the San Pablo Bay, okay. which is right right behind us. But I would say like 80, 85 percent of the time, the wind is coming from the gap that you see behind us, which is called the Petaluma Gap. Go straight to Bodega Bay, and most of the time we have a very, very cool wind from the Bodega Bay going through there. It actually takes up some speed. Um, so over there it's a little bit less than it is over here, so we even have, have uh, stronger winds here. We have a little bit cooler climate here, and that's why, why Walter um, put the grapes here. It's like perfect, perfect terra, perfect weather for, for growing Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Hey, I'm here with Mike, the general manager, and Michelle, the winemaker here at Minor Family Wines. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming out today. Uh, we're a Miner Family Winery. Uh, we started in 1996 with Dave Miner. Uh, he originally started in the wine business in 93 with his uh, uncle uh, with the Oakville Ranch Winery. And he started this in 96 with his wife Emily. And here we're standing in our, our Oakville Napa, Napa Valley cab block. I know that um, it's obviously being in Napa, it gets very, very hot, very arid, um, not a lot of rain, although you guys had a lot of rain over the winter and spring. Um, 
drip irrigation seems to be very important. Can you kind of tell me a little bit yeah. about that and how that plays such an important role? Yeah, so you know we have a lot of rain through the winter time um, and into spring. Um, of course, this is a Mediterranean climate, so uh, we have almost all of our rainfall is between the months of October to about April, and then through the summer it's it's dry and semi-arid here. Um, and we do use drip irrigation. Um, if you were to compare the climates of Napa Valley versus Bordeaux, they're similar but also very different. Um, here in Napa, we're hotter than in Bordeaux. The North Coast has a wide variety of soil types, and we can attribute that to the tectonic plates and volcanic activity from over 150 million years ago. Generally, the soils from the slopes are rocky and poor in nutrients, whereas the more fertile soils are found on the flat land and valley floors. Here, you find more silt and clay. Alluvial fans with deep gravel can be found near the base of the mountains. These were created by streams as they reach the valley and can be excellent growing sites. Um, a little bit of geology, obviously, we've got two different mountainsides, so the Vacas and the Mayacamas, you know, so at least when all those things were happening millions of years ago, so we've got amazing soils um, that go through here. Uh, Oakville is such a special little site, and being on the valley floor, you know, we've just got so many nutrients that go in, you've got some good sunlight, you've got a little bit of shade, um, but yeah, it, it's a little piece of heaven here. Um, and you know, we've got so many different things like, like I said, organic, we've got natural predators, so owl boxes, we've got bluebird okay. boxes. Um, but yeah, we've just found the soil profiles are amazing. And most, uh, most people in the area here, or as we do, uh, Peter Noir in the hills, more well-draining soils, and then Chardonnay a little bit more on the bottom, um, a little bit wetter, a little bit, little bit cooler soils. Um, so the both, you know, varieties have different expectations, they have different liking. In, in Europe, you have to drive hours to get such <laughs> different, um, you know, uh, variation in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in grapes, you know, from, from Burgundy to Bordeaux, but here it's a half hour, 40 minutes. So it's so diverse, you know, and something we've, we've expanded upon beyond our 40 acres of vineyard here is, uh, is buying grapes from, you know, these cool, um, uh, interesting vineyards, some you know east facing or or west facing at different elevation, different soil types, different clones, because uh, because Pinot Noir probably more than any other grape just really reflects you know where it's from the, mm -hmm. the terroir. Let's explore the viticultural practices and grape varieties further with some of the producers here in Napa and Sonoma. We'll get their take on what winemaking techniques are necessary to produce some of these extravagant wines. Low rainfall during the growing season means irrigation is common. The low rainfall combined with the cool coastal breeze reduce the risk of fungal disease, although bacterial disease is becoming more common. Most vines are pruned and trained to cordon or replacement spur and vertical shoot positioning, or VSP trellising. This allows for better canopy management and mechanization for flat vineyards in the valley. Some of the vineyards on steeper mountain slopes will often be harvested by hand. Because the North Coast does experience cooler nights, frost can be a problem on valley floors, whereas sites on the mountains will experience warmer evening and early morning temperatures. Have the, the old property on Atlas Peak, and then here what we call base camp. And so they completely redeveloped the base camp vineyard to eight acres. It's got some Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, a little bit of Merlot, and then a tiny bit of Sauvignon Blanc and Sauvignon Musquet. So it's all part of very integral parts of the programs. It's just fun. We just grafted over, so you just see the new. The new shoots growing. Uh, we grafted, I think, was it in, in April, uh, I believe, and so now just it's just slowly growing for 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 new wine to come. Yeah, it's gonna be a couple of years before. Yeah, it's yeah, it's, it, it's it'll probably we'll get our first fruit off of it in probably two more years. You got to train it okay. properly. So, and with the vintage this year, everything is looking pretty good. I know it's been a little bit cooler, so stuff's not ripening quite as. Yeah, quick. so I mean, it's it's just take your time, you know. So we don't have any huge heat wave, so that just means harvest will be a little later, and that's fine. So as long as long as nature's kind to us, we'll be, we'll be very rewarding. So 
So, you know, very mild temperatures so far this year. So great. Look, and looking forward to it. Anything that we can expect with, with this new vintage? Uh, I, th I think the, so far we can tell the yields will be a little lower, so, but that usually translates to kind of higher quality. So lower yields will balance out the higher quality. So, so, so far so good. You know, everybody, 99% of all vineyards yeah. here in California are irrigated. It's just too dry. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, we have to irrigate. But other than that, we have really healthy, dry climate, wind flowing through. So we really have a, a, I would say, like a really fortunate uh, growing season here in Do California, you, besides the, the lack of water. <laughs> and, and that's what I was going to say. So obviously the water stress, but do you yeah. deal with any other fungal diseases or, or um, I mean, not, bacteria? Not, or not really. It's, okay. just, it's just being lucky here. It's, it's dry. There's no humidity. We have the wind flowing through. And that really helps, you know, we have healthy soils combined with this kind of weather helps or gives us really nice and healthy wines. Excellent. Grapes well. without doing too much. Then in the 80s, we, um, my uh, father and vineyard manager, they transferred everything over to organic growing. So we've been organic growers uh, since the late 80s. Um, so we're very proud of that. So we've still got some dry farm blocks as well. Um, and then my dad created some organic um, cover crop mixture. So we've been continuing that tradition. And we're very proud of it. Um, but the family in total owns seven single vineyards and it amounts to about 600 acres. Um, and so we try and dedicate each vineyard to either a brand or a specific uh, bottle of wine, which we can get into when we do the tasting. The grapes of the North Coast are the same as those grown across the whole state. Cabernet Sauvignon and Chardonnay together make up approximately half of total plantings. Pinot Noir is often seen further north and closer to cool sites near the ocean, and Zinfandel can be found in warmer sites further inland. Merlot and Sauvignon Blanc are also found. Michelle, can you tell me a little bit about the grapes behind us? Oh yeah, so this uh, block here, this is our state vineyard uh, planted to Cabernet Sauvignon or Napa, of course, so we grow some cab. Um, and we're located here in Oakville um, at the base of the Vacas Mountain Range. We uh, source grapes from a number of different growers that we have close relationships with, mostly in Napa Valley. Um, and in addition to Cabernet and Bordeaux style blends, we also make Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, Dave Miner, the owner, he is quite the Rhone-ophile, so Rhone varietals are a very important part of our portfolio, what we make, so we have a Pinot which is delicious. We also make um, Syrah. We have a Grenache Syrah Morved blend um, that I really love. Yeah, how um, many wines do we make? 30 skews, give or take. <laughs> I and think it's just a few. Lots of little fun projects, but I love that. Yeah, I think it's great really for a winemaker to be yeah. able to experiment right. with all these stuff, and it really adds value to what we're doing here, yeah. too, with the Rhone wines, yeah. Pinot wines, Bordeaux wines. Um, we are here in one of our Pinot Noir blocks, um, planted to Dijon 667. One of our smaller blocks here. Um, now it's uh, towards, we're here towards the end of July. Usually at this time of the year, we would already see a little bit of erosion, a little bit of color change. Mm -hmm. Here we see like, it's just like two little berries yeah, there's a few that are changing like... their color. Um, next week, we'll definitely see more purple, still a little bit of green. And you mentioned the, uh, the clonal type. Mm -hmm. um, is, is, so that's uh, from Burgundy or? It's a, it's a Dijon, it's, okay. a, it's a Burgundy Dijon clones. We have some uh, Pomart, we have a Pomart clone, Pomart oh, okay. 4, Pomart 5. Uh, we have a Dijon 115. We have four different Pinot clones here on our property, uh, different soil types. Here we have more um, loam clay. We have a little bit more rock content in our steeper hills over there. And that helps us to determine which kind of uh, clones to choose, Perfect. which ones thrive best in each given terrain, wind direction, spacing, all that influence uh, the, the grape wines. Winemaking techniques in the North Coast are as diverse as the grapes and region itself. From big, bold, extracted Cabernet Sauvignon to light and refreshing Sauvignon Blanc, let's see how each winemaker makes their wines unique to their own vineyards and sites. Hey, so we're in the winery with Kendall and Jeff, the associate winemaker. Can you tell us a little bit about what we've got behind us and what's going on here? This is our 2022 Sauvignon Blanc. Okay. These are white barrels. Awesome. 
from my understanding, the Savion Blanc does see about what, six months or so on the lees? Yeah, we typically um, age it Sir Lee and we'll stir it every month for about six months. Okay. And that's yeah, only a, maybe 50% of it. Can you tell us about um, the Cabernet Sauvignon? I, I know that we passed some of those barrels as well. So when the grapes are ready, which is probably the biggest influence on quality, we will harvest them by hand and we'll sort them and um, pick out all of the mog, de-stem them, and then I like to ferment them you know, really fast, really hot, extract as much color as I can, as much tannin, as quickly as I can, and then um, I, I press the wine and I will age it again in um, you know, American, okay. not so much, but French. And then I assume you've got your Zinfandel in here as well. We do, um, and yeah, it's aging in the same conditions. Okay. We try to maintain a stable barrel climate, so we look at humidity, we look at temperature, and you know we're investing in zippy doors so that the cold right. air doesn't get out. Um, yeah, to keep everything healthy. So Michelle, can you tell us a little bit about the facility we have here? Yeah, so this is our tank room here. So we have a number of different sized tanks, everything from a thousand gallons thousand gallons which don't get used very often and uh, I know that now at the end of July it's not quite so interesting because everything is empty uh, but we're gearing up for harvest so everything is getting clean sanitized it will be sparkling um, then we'll start bringing in fruit at the end of August hopefully um, starting with Sauvignon Blanc then usually rolling into Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, then Cabernet and other Bordeaux varietals. Um, so when we make our Chardonnay wine we will bring in those grapes, squish them, press them, get the juice out, uh, let the juice settle in one of these tanks for a few days, and then from there that juice will go into oak barrels, usually uh, French oak is what we prefer here, and uh, then ferment in barrel. Many of our Chardonnays we choose to ferment uh, wild, so that means not adding a known inoculum of yeast. Uh, for Cabernet Sauvignon, another wine that we make here, we will uh, bring that fruit in, take it off of the stems, put it into one of these tanks for about two weeks or so. Um, and then during fermentation, we'll pump over once or twice a day until it tastes just right, that we've extracted enough color, enough tannins from the skins, and then press that. That goes to barrel, goes through malolactic fermentation, the secondary fermentation where malic acid is converted to lactic acid. Um, and again, we're using different types of barrels. So French oak, um, and one of the most fun parts of winemaking, people ask me about how, how do you make wine? Like, what's the mindset for that? I, I always tell people, it's a lot like cooking. It just takes two years. Yeah. Um, so you'll have your, your barrels, and it's like your spices. So you'll smell your barrels, you've got your medium toast, your medium plus toast, maybe a little pinch of heavy toast, and you put those all together, that helps to augment the wine. So for Cabernet Sauvignon, um, sometimes we like to blend in a little bit of Cabernet Franc, a little bit of Merlot to kind of, kind of as a, an homage to like a more old world style of winemaking. Uh, Dave Miner, the owner here, um, he really loves a good Bordeaux wine, you know, a nice right bank is kind of his thing. Um, and so we kind of look at those wines, we're not trying to, to mimic them, but we just want to keep that style in mind with our own winemaking here. What I like to hear, and it's great, is yeah. that it's, there's no set recipe. It's really yeah. you and your team tasting these barrels and Absolutely. coming up with what you think is, is right. And that's exactly what, what it is. So when you look at our uh, flagship wine, the Oracle, which is a Bordeaux-style blend, every year that blend will be different. So about a year and a half post-harvest, me, Dave, Mike, uh, we will sit down and taste the individual lots that we have of Bordeaux varietals, be Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, uh, Merlot, maybe Malbec or Petit Bordeaux, taste them individually, see what really is kind of shining, and then start to play around with blends. And that could be like 20 different iterations of blends before we really kind of like are able to like narrow in on what we want that wine to be for that vintage. Um, and sometimes, you know, we'll go through 20, 20 plus different trial blends, and then we'll be like, oh yeah, number three was the best. Right. Um, but it's still, it's, it's a really wonderful process because there's no recipe, there's no mathematical formula you can really do for this because when the components come together, it's greater than the sum of the parts. So you can't always predict exactly what the combination should be because of that matrix when it comes together. It'll, it'll form something new that you wouldn't expect. You know, 18 months to 24 months in barrel. Uh, and so from, from that, it's all French oak, around between 60 to 70%. So average that in 65. Okay. Um, 
and it's all French oak. Uh, and we also have a beautiful white wine program where we do a little bit of stainless steel and neutral oak and French oak. So it's not, I'm not quite a third of a third, but it kind of fluctuates. From okay. And uh, how do you determine, you know, um, what percentage or, you know, you know, it's it's in in the tank. So uh, oak regimes, you kind of have to order it now. They ship it over from France, and so it's as you're tasting the wine and tank, how structured is it? Does it need more oak? Does it not need more oak? And then that's just the final decision is there. So it's kind of uh, not same day decision, but you right. know, just kind of when you're done fermenting and done macerating, uh, that's when you decide a little more, a little less. So. And you've got some white wines as well that are not the same. Uh, about uh, about about thirty percent new okay. oak. Yeah, that's okay. it. just kind of a kiss of new oak to kind of add the complexity. So when you do that new neutral stainless steel, you're building on that layering complexity of the wine. For seven apart, I think uh, for the stylistically, it's it's very vineyard designate. So okay. you know, it's it's the, the Atlas Peak Vineyard uh, called uh, Stags Ridge is is a very old vineyard. I think it was planted in 97. 99? 99. Uh, so it's just. It's, it's, at its, it's at its peak quality right now with age. And so it's just kind of the, the top wine, Summit, Shale, and Salt are, are from there. It's just really parcels within that. And so it's, it's just kind of beautiful when it's in your nose and like that. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. And just kind of every year is very consistent. Same parcels, same blocks. That's great. And so it's, yeah. it's really cool when, when you can generate that high quality consistently at the same time. It's, it's a special I've heard a lot about that. Video. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's, like it's, 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 it's one of those places when you go there for the first time and you look at the soils, the color of the soils, and the rockiness of it, it's, you kind of feel it in your bones. Like, this is a special place. Yeah. It's, a, it's a 1,400 feet elevation, so it took millions of years of just geology. So, Dave, uh, we're in a pretty cool cave right now. Can you tell us a little bit about the history and, and you know where we're walking right now? Sure. Uh, we're in one of uh, about 6,000 square feet of caves uh, that Walter Shug uh, built in 1990. Uh, the brand was founded in 1980. Uh, Walter was the original winemaker, Joseph Phelps. He made the first 99-point wine and uh, a Bordeaux blend called Insignia. But um, we've been here since 1990. Uh, like I say, the caves were built, um, you know, with the idea of not only making wine, but also housing guests. I mean, this is how Excellent. wine was made and stored yeah, uh, in Europe. So there's our European roots and his German roots are, are still with us. Excellent. Um, anything else as far as, I know you've got a couple different rooms um, that branch off from these caves. Uh, what are some of those rooms like? Oh. Um, well, we, we like to you know, bring people and show people what we do. I think when Walter built this winery, it really wasn't the idea uh, to see a lot of visitors, but that's what's happened in the wine industry. Yeah. People expect an experience. People expect uh, you know uh, to to see uh, you know some uh, uh, high end and you know all these sorts of things that uh, entertainment is the word I'm looking for. for sure. That back in the day uh, really wasn't part of winemaking. Back in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, facilities were built to make wine. So we but we have renovated a couple areas uh, inside of our caves. Um, we've got a, a robust uh, wine club uh, membership. Our wine club members like visiting us from, from all around the world. And we just felt that being in the case, where we make the wine, you know, seeing the winemakers and the, and the team in action uh, is kind of second to none. Of course, bringing everyone a little bit closer. Wine's so much more than just what's actually in the bottle, but yeah. sharing it. Yeah, yeah. these aren't actors when you see them. These are real people working in the caves. So. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. From coastal sites to steep mountains, from deep inland valleys to cool vineyards off the bay, California's north coast is as diverse as it comes, and the wine showcase every aspect of this remarkable region. I hope you enjoyed this California adventure. Many cheers. So we have the Sauvignon Blanc in front of us. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. Um, this is our uh, brand new release. It's the 2022 vintage. Um, and this is made in sort of a French Sancerre style, but we age it eight months through leaves. And so there's some really nice weight on the palate. It really doesn't change the flavor profile. We still like a nice strong citrus backbone. 
um, with stone fruit, always some really nice white peach or white grape fruit. Surly's aging really just adds another dimension to the wine. And so when it's on your palate, you just feel those richer notes, but still crisp and clean and beautiful and such a beautiful summer wine. Because we also pick it in three picks, so it'll be a different bricks at oh, each excellent. point. So again, that adds to the complexity. First vintage was 2007. And this a really great story. This is from our Morgan Lee Vineyard, which was named after me. And this bottle of wine in the very first vintage was presented to me on my 21st birthday. Oh, great, yeah. And um, so we've been making it since 2007. and. It's absolutely my favorite. I mean, the vineyard site <laughs> is 32 acres that surrounds my family home. So a really special place. Um, but Sauvignon Blanc has always been just my favorite varietal in general. Now we're pouring our Elizabeth Rose brand. Um, Ghost Block Estate Wines is made up of three brands. Elizabeth Rose being named after Kendall, and she'll tell you a little bit about uh, the story of her 21st birthday. But um, her husband is the winemaker for Elizabeth Rose. It's the newest Elizabeth Rose wine out in distribution, and it's a red blend. 67% um, Cabernet, 18% Merlot, and 15% Malbec. So we use three of the Bordeaux varietals, um, and we call it Chocoblock. And a lot of people don't know that that's actually a word in the English dictionary. <laughs> and it means crowded, busy, full, jammed. Perfect. And it's a word that I came up with because my I hear my mother and my grandmother use it kind of when they're talking about parking lot or traffic. Right. They're like, it's just chock-a-block out there. That's funny. <laughs> and so when we decided we wanted to create a Bordeaux varietal, I'm like, let's call it chock-a-block. Yeah, so uh, my middle name is Elizabeth because uh, there's no way we could ever get Kendall patented anywhere. <laughs> so, um, so we just came up with Elizabeth Rose and it just rolls off the tongue nicely. Um, and then there actually is a sixth generation Elizabeth, so we can continue that but um, yeah it's uh, I always thought a, dr a red dry red would be a great addition to it because we grow these things and especially our you know not too many people in Napa Valley grow Malbec and it just adds a nice addition to it and there's like that pop of fruit I mean mm -hmm. you can really pick it's, out it's know. a beautiful structure and it's just so elegant with not super harsh tannins and it's like I love drinking these Elizabeth Rose wines every night of the week. I mean, yeah. we make a Chardonnay, we make a Pinot Noir, and they're just kind of like, forget about it wines. They hit a perfect price point yeah. for somebody that wants to enjoy wine. And you can drink this with pizza, you can drink it with a steak. I mean, yeah. it's so versatile um, that it's such a fun wine. Excellent. Yeah, it's definitely our house wine. <laughs> yeah. Michelle, Mike, uh, you want to tell us a little bit about the Chardonnay we have? Absolutely. So this is our 2022 Napa Valley Chardonnay. Uh, Chardonnay is a very important wine that we make. Um, actually, I remember before I ever started working here, I came here to taste and was actually just really impressed with the Chardonnays that were being made. That was back when Gary Brookman was winemaker. Um, so I was very excited that I got to uh, work with him, learn under him, and kind of really see how we make Chardonnay here. For this wine, we're going for something that's not quite so rich, buttery, something fresher, lighter. Uh, so about 20% of it is fermented in stainless steel. Okay. Uh, it only goes through a partial malolactic fermentation. The wine that is fermented in barrel has about 40% new French oak versus 60%. So it's less of an impact from oak, so less mm. of that buttery character. Yeah, of more, the, more, more acidity. More acidity, more yeah, yeah, acidity. Yeah, yeah, and so for fresh, this, yeah. it only goes through pa partial malolactic fermentations. Um, after all the Chardonnay fruit has come into the winery, we've pressed it for juice done our initial chemistry panels on the juice to kind of see where the chemistries are at. I'll take the weighted average of the malic acid for all of the Chardonnay juice, cut that number in half, and that's actually my target for this wine. But I still want that freshness, so that's why we, we really wanted to have a little bit of the creaminess that the malolactic fermentation brings, that lactic acid, which you associate with maybe yogurt, mm -hmm. um, but balancing that with the retention of malic acid, yeah. which is more apple. All right, so in front of us we have the Oracle. Yeah, this is our flagship. I mean, we're really well known for our Oracle blend. Uh, we're excited to taste this with you today, uh, and especially because the blend changes every year. Yeah, yeah. so being our flagship wine, this is going to be the best of what we make. Um, every um, year and a half post-harvest, uh, we will sit down with the individual uh, Bordeaux varietal lots 
and taste through them and just really see what is showing the best and then from that construct a blend and we can go through many different iterations of trial blends before we can kind of nail down what we want this to be. It'll be uh, usually about 60% Cabernet Sauvignon, 20% Cabernet Franc, 10 to 15% Merlot, um, and, which this one is, uh, and there's just a little bit of Malbec and Petit Verdot in there as well. Uh, so for the Oracle, this is definitely going to be dominated by fruit that's grown on hillsides or on mountains, especially Atlas Peak okay. is an area that we really love. Um, and it's going to have that complexity and that depth, that kind of like that dark heart to it and that structure where this is a wine you want to lay down for a number of years. Mm -hmm. um, and we want this wine to kind of showcase Napa Valley. This is, this is going to be what we get from this location and vintage to vintage it'll be different as a reflection of how every vintage is just going to be a little bit different. And it's named Oracle after Dave's uncle Bob, Bob Miner, one of the founders of Oracle Software. And he, he had a huge impact in Dave's life and got him into the wine business. That's so great. Dave wanted to do this in mm -hmm. honor of his uncle Bob. Yeah, the wine's great. It's got that savory component, but mm -hmm. yeah, that, that dried sage and really long finish. I was super mm -hmm. impressed with that, the like, dark cherries mm -hmm. or the uh, chocolate covered cherries, like all the way yeah. to the end, so. Yeah, it's also it's integrated. Delicious. Yeah. You know, and not, not one is overpowering. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm glad that everyone's enjoying it. Cheers. 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 Hey, we're at Gotts Roadside, a St. Helena classic and staple since 1999. Here you can get burgers, fries, even soft serve, all locally sourced and sustainable food right here from Napa Valley. Let's go take a look. What's like the most famous thing to get here? here well, I would probably say like for uh, burger wise, you got like the Texas burger. That would come like with avocado, for the Pico de Gallo, Jack T. We also do have a Wisconsin burger that would come with like bacon, mushrooms, the bologna bun, the mayo, the cheddar cheese. Nice, let's, let's do that. So one Wisconsin. Um, and then can I do the peach cobbler parfait? Peach cobbler. And let's uh, round it out with a glass of the Pinot Grigio. She was like, oh my god, that's amazing. 82? 82. Very awesome. I'll call you back for your shake, please. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right, here we go. We got their famous Wisconsin burger as well as one of their peach cobbler parfaits. So pretty stoked about this. Let's give it a try. Mmm, delicious. So good. Farm fresh ingredients too. Most everything's locally sourced. Let's give this parfait a try too. So good. If you're in town, you gotta check it out. State grown Chardonnay. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Shoga State sits on 50 acres in southern Sonoma Valley in the Carneros district. Yeah, and um, as Dave was saying, went to clone and blended in 1990. So you can imagine uh, the yields are very, very small um, when you see the clusters, they're like super tiny clusters. Um, we have the strong wind here, they have a little bit thicker skins. and. It's just so much aromatic in those wines. And th does this this sees some oak? Yeah, this wine 100%, okay. uh, also 100% barrel fermentation. Okay. Um, we use roughly 30% new oak on this one, but it depends on the vintage. Um, I always want the you know the vintage to be king, the vintage to to show, and um, we just follow it and we see what what works best for the wine too. And I think you said it best. I mean, the first thing I noticed when you smell it, I mean, that's the, that concentration of that fruit. I mean, it's very it, mature. It's the, very, it's, it's the most concentrated wine. Yeah. It's, it's just those very, very ripe flavors. 
baked flavors, spice, almonds. Yeah. There, there's something cool about a state grown wine. So in order for us to call a state growers, you know, the, the grapes have to be grown here, mm -hmm. they have to be processed here, it has to be bottled here. So mm -hmm. something cool about knowing that, you know, this yeah. the wine that's in this bottle mm -hmm. from the grapes and they've never left the property. Mm -hmm. It's kind of cool. Yeah. We have people come out here, it's like, hey, you know, the wine you have in your glass, it's, it's grown a couple hundred right feet there. over there. Yeah. It's, it's like, it, it can't be closer. And that's also something that you can age for. Mm. I like aging Chardonnay yeah. too, where it's like, you know, you put it away for five years and see what happens. Yeah, and you put it away for another 10 years. It's, yeah, it got that natural acidity, which would help, you know, the wine uh, stay alive and evolve over time too. This is our flagship, our 2021 Carneros Pinot Noir, our state being, you know, kind of being in the heart of Carneros, Walter Schug. Uh, being so in instrumental in, in creating the CVA. And that's, that's so, uh, it's, we're very proud of this wine and um, a wine like this requires a lot of um, special foods, food sourcing. Mm -hmm. um, some of our best uh, estate blocks go into this blend. It's a lot of detail work here in the vineyards too. It's like reduced um, crop levels, reducing the yields, um, really getting only the, the best fruit and then treating treating the fruit in the best way to being as gentle as possible, um, using the best coopers to work with, and just, just giving the wine the attention in the time it needs. And um, <clears throat> it usually ages for nine to 10 months in small French oak barrels, roughly 25% new. I mean, you see it on the color here, nice um, dark, Pinot Noir color, still yeah. very, still very young, 2021 vintage, and in the nose, <clears throat> a lot of, lot of um, layered fruit components, um, some floral notes, yeah. rose petal, yeah. um, wet rocks, almost a little bit, wild berries. And then you get the, you, you get the oak, <clears throat> you get the new oak, you, you get the, the oak tannins, giving the wine structure, giving the wine length. And yeah, a lot, lot of lot of layers in here too. Enough structure to you know for you know light uh, summer salad dishes yeah. to absolutely uh, hang out with the steak as well. Exactly, you can enjoy with the with the rich uh, you know meat dishes. So the very first bread that we have on, on the left side, that is our introduction wine. This is what we started the winery with. The 2018 vintage was the very first vintage. That's what um, the first release we ever had, actually. That's our expedition Cabernet Sauvignon. And the expedition for us, it's a blend and it's that journey, starting with our base camp vineyard and getting all the way to the summit of Atlas Peak. So we really wanted to combine those elements together, having fruits dominantly from this side. Yeah but 65% and 35% from our Stags Ridge property up on Atlas Peak, but it's not only a blend from the vineyard, but it's also a very blend. So the 18 was almost 100% Cab, it's 98% Cabernet Sauvignon with 1% of Cabernet Franc and 1% of Merlot. Um, boil the wine, let it sit for a few months, so we can let it settle down, but it's also one that is meant to be enjoyed from releasing it. Uh, that just drinks extremely well, that's soft, delicate, velvety, that has good tannin structure, great acidity balance, not overpowering by any means, but can age for years to come as well. Oh yeah, those tannins are, oh, they're so smooth, they're there, but yeah, like you said, very well integrated. Yeah, whether you want to drink it young or aged. 18 and 19, fantastic year. So we came from 18, which was an amazing year. 19 was outstanding. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, so the brand is a little bit different. Right here, what we have, it's 91% Cabernet Sauvignon. We have 5% Cabernet Franc, 3 Merlot, and 1 Petit Verdot. And uh, same concept, 1,500 cases, about 60, 65% New York, 18 months in barrel as well. Mm -hmm. um, and the 19 is just a, also such a very soft wine. I mean, again, I find it even smoother than the 18, where it's just very delicate on the finish and you feel that acidity balance. The tannins are there, but not just overpowering and dry. Um, so very soft approach on the, on the wine world. And then what's amazing here is that we have a 2020. Yeah. So 2020, is, as we know, was a changing year. I mean, on all the spectrum. Yeah. <laughs> between COVID, COVID between uh, the fire that we've experienced here in Napa. 
So we were very fortunate that we were able to harvest this property between the 11th and the 14th of September, a couple of weeks before the fire started up north mm. on the 27th of September. And then so what's so unique about this one is that we had on this property before we went through a replan, we had some petite sura as well. Okay, yeah. So we used petite sura to offset the complexity of the mountain fruit cabinet that we didn't get from our stack bridge property. A little property. bit of tan structure. Exactly, yeah, that depth, that coloration yeah. in there. So you have 85% cabinet, okay. 9 Merlot and 6 Petit Sura. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that color, and, I mean... Uh, well, you can see definitely that beautiful purple yeah, view to beautiful. it. Um, you get this nice sugar-coated strawberry from the Merlot that really kicks yeah. in there. Yeah, it's very good. Very concentrated, very like, pronounced fruit flavors. Jeez. It is. And then you do have a little bit more of that heavier body structure. Yeah. You have the alcohol is a bit heavier as well. And again, younger wine. Yeah. That will soften out over time. It will definitely dissipate. But it's just, again, extremely approachable and very fortunate that we have something for that vintage. What's great about I mean, all of these is you can certainly tell where it, it's going to age like, beautifully, mm -hmm. but they're still very approachable. And younger, mm -hmm. you know, the tannins are well integrated, very smooth, they're present, but you know, not overpowering, not bitter, not uh, you know, too grippy. They're beautiful wines. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's thank you. very, very good.